Welcome to Peak Worship. We're so excited that you decided to join us today. Pastor Alma has a great word for you today and we're believing and praying that it's gonna change your life. I'm excited because God has a word for you like he had a word for me several weeks ago. And so we're gonna jump right in. God is so faithful. He knows exactly what we need, when we need it, and he operates at our level. He doesn't go above and beyond where we don't understand him. And he's a, he's a practical God. And I think his, his spirituality can be just as practical as us having a dialogue one-on-one, -on -one, riding a bike. So it's good to see that God can come down and meet us just right where we're at. So we're going to jump right into the word. But most of us in here, all of us, we are all believers in Jesus Christ. I don't think there's anyone here that doesn't know the Lord. And I think most of us have been in God's kingdom for quite a while. And um, when I say a while, you've gotten familiar with what, I guess what Christians say, um, Christianese, um, which is not good because we don't want to be stereotyped by what we say. But it's the fact of the matter is sometimes we get in ruts of things that we say, right? And one of the things that we, we tend to say as Christians is, Maybe you've heard this, and we can get some interaction here. By, if it wasn't for his grace, I wouldn't be here. I mean, either we have said it, we've heard other people say it. Um, by the grace of God, we just say it. We, we don't even know what we're saying. It just comes out of our mouth because we're Christians, and that's what we know to say. Um, if it wasn't for your grace, there's a song that Israel Houghton sings. Um, where would I be if, if not for your grace? That song, fantastic song. You need to look that up. But it's, it's talking about his grace for us. And so, like I said, we just throw it out. We say it consciously. Sometimes we say it unconsciously, like just if it wasn't for his grace, but we don't really think about what we're saying. A few weeks ago, Joshua and I were bike riding. You know, he's three and a half, and we have been bike riding about five to six days a week in our community. And we were bike riding, and in my community, I live on a golf course, and there's a part on the golf course that has a, a, a gravel driveway for the golf carts. But I make Joshua ride on, that gra ride on that gravel part because he can't be on the road because he's a little kid. But at, on that gravel sidewalk, it eventually finishes. Like in front of me and I'm behind him. And the sidewalk stops. It's cut off. There's no more sidewalk. And... There's like probably from here to the back door where there's nothing but grass and, and um, the part of the, it's part of the golf course. But you can see the sidewalk that you're supposed to be on a few feet away. And so I tell Joshua, he, he has a fit because he wants, a, he wants a straight path. And I said, get off your bike and push your bike to the sidewalk. And because he has training wheels, so is, the ground for him would be unlevel and he would tip over. For me... I could ride the bike on the unlevel ground, and that's okay. But I tell him, get off your bike and push your bike to the sidewalk that you see. And at that very moment, the Lord really spoke to me. It's amazing how God talks to you. I'm telling you, God speaks to you through your children. I mean, even before, before Joshua, I feel like the Lord sometimes would speak to me and just different things that we go through in life. But... I have never experienced like the way God speaks to me now through my son. And he shows you little gl glimpses of who he is through your children. Um, so anyways, we are, we're riding, we're pushing our bike to the sidewalk that we see. And as I'm telling him to do that, I immediately, I felt in my spirit. Sometimes in life, we experience pleasurable bike rides we experience bike rides where there are no pits in the ground. The, the sidewalk is level. There's a few hiccups in life, right? A few hiccups. But it's not like so traumatic that, that it takes us off the course. We're riding our bike on this smooth, pleasurable ride because we're experiencing his grace, his grace on this smooth ride. And that's until we get to a point where the sidewalk finishes. That's until the point in life where something happens in life and there's something that just shifted. You feel it when something's going wrong in your life and something has just shifted. Further along in our bike ride, in our community, 
We're, we're riding some more on our bike, and we come across, we're on our sidewalk, we're on, the, we're on the sidewalk, we come to this big pile of trees, like someone trimmed their trees on their property, and all they did, they dumped it on their front yard, um, and it's overlapping onto their sidewalk. So here we are again, treading our bike, and we get to this big pile of debris. And once again, we stop. And once again, I tell Joshua, get off your bike because you got to go around. In life, we can see this. We know there's a sidewalk underneath all that pile of debris, right? We know that there's sidewalk on the other side. And literally, you couldn't see the sidewalk on the other side. It was so massive. And I told Joshua, get off your bike and go to the other side. And I just felt the Lord tell me again. It, was, it all happened the same day, how God spoke to me. And God's like, we get to moments like that, and we're like, God, what are you doing? What mess do you have me in? The audacity that we have. But what do you have me in? Like, what is this sudden shift? Sometimes we feel like God is throwing us a curveball, and we don't know what did we just step into. Everything has been going good. We've, we've had this pleasurable bike ride and now we've come to a halt or we've come to this blockade you know this pile of debris and the Lord spoke to me so clearly not audibly but I just sensed it I sensed that God said the same grace that I had for you on the smooth bike ride is the same grace that I have for you on the ride that you have to take from here to the other side of that sidewalk and sometimes that ride to, from point A to point B, like I said, it's bumpy. The, the ground usually is not level. Sometimes there are blockades in front of you. The sidewalk stops abruptly. But God said that the same grace that I had for you on the smooth, uh, pleasurable life that you, had, that you have is the same grace that I have for you as you're about to come off this sidewalk, as you're, as you're about to come off this course. And, and it's, it's amazing to me how even in moments like this, we're still like shocked that we're gonna encounter some trial and processes because we're, we're all called to grow in God and we all know that, right? If I'm still drinking milk at 38 years old, shame on me if I have not gone up to meat. And that's, that's a practical way of saying that I'm still feeding on the, the, the little things and I have not grown up to know the, the other things of God, the, the other things that God is trying to show you. I'm not trying to minimize anybody's spiritual walk here, but there should be signs of growth in our lives. We should have measurable spurts in our life where should, that, that shows that we're growing in God. And God spoke to me so clearly that that in moments like this, when there's unfamiliarity and it's uncomfortable, we should still keep up the fight. Just like when we're experiencing God and God is showing us favor, we're getting promotion on the left, we're, we're, God is blessing us with provision on the right. I'm, I'm believing God that we're still like, we're, we're digging the trenches and seeking God and, and meeting Him and we're having a relationship with Him. But in these times of unfamiliarity and, and, and uncomfort, uncomfortability, that, that is a word, just so you know, we should keep up the fight and obey God. Obey God and still do what he requires of us. You know, Joshua and I, my son Joshua and I, still had to walk our bikes around the blockade. We still had to either walk around the blockade or walk through the, the unlevel ground to get to the other side, to get to the sidewalk. You know, we couldn't wait for the builders of the community to build the sidewalk. I couldn't sit there and say, I'm not moving until the sidewalk is built. That's unrealistic, that is senseless. I can't wait for the city of Lakeland to come pick up this pile of debris of limbs that someone just tri uh, trimmed their trees. No, that's, that's illogical, that's, there's no common sense. That's lack of reasoning. No, the only reasoning for us to have is to go around it, right? Well, <clears throat> that means that when we go through things in life, that means we still have to go, we still have to dig through the trenches. We don't just stop because, because God is doing something different. 
No, we do what we know to do. We do what we know to do. And you may be sitting here, well, I don't know what to do. Well, then seek his face. You can't go, you can't go wrong with seeking his face. And, and, and some of us have been seeking God. And we come across a curveball. We come across a blockade. We come across a, a, a sidewalk that has finished abruptly. Then we keep on doing what we know to do. We seek his face and we obey him. In this part of our life where there's unfamiliarity and we're uncomfortable, we still have to obey him. We can't just say, well, I don't know what you're doing, God, so I'm just going to sit. No, we can't do that. There's a fight that we still have to keep up. We still have to keep up. And in this uncomfortable state, God is saying, God is saying, obey me and you will find my grace. Obey me and you will find my grace. And sometimes we don't want to obey God and we still want his grace. We still want to do what we want to do, but we still want God's grace to cover us. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. God wants full obedience. He wants full obedience. God is not calling me to partially go around the blockade, then I would never get to my destination. I somehow have to dig through there, seek God, do what I got to do to get to the other side. So there should be a fight within us when God throws, I hate to say that God throws us a curveball, but sometimes we go through things because it's part of our process. God is growing you. We can't stay drinking milk. We have to eat meat at some point. But God wants full obedience. There are many people in the Bible that we saw that we have seen God's grace cover them. And we're going to talk about a specific, a specific person in the Bible, and that is Noah. Everyone knows about Noah. We're going to go to the very beginning book of the Bible. We're going to see that grace was not just dropped on his lap. It wasn't. And we see that through multiple people in the Bible where grace wasn't just Okay, you want to do whatever you want? Here's grace. You can't do that. You can't live a sloppy lifestyle and expect God's grace to cover you. There, God is calling us to full obedience. So we're going to talk about Noah. He was a righteous man, and he lived in a corrupt society, right? And there was a lot of violence. If you read the story, you can find out the kind of things that were going on during that time. And God told Noah, that's it. I am done with the earth. The earth is too corrupt and I'm going to destroy the earth. So God commanded Noah to build this ark. I love this story and it, and it becomes more alive when you, when you actually teach children. When you teach children, you get to see the little details as to the little things that God did to his people and, and these children are absorbing what God did. You ask my son, he knows Noah and the ark. Um, all these other little stories, not because I've been diligent until teaching him, but because he is here at Peak Worship in our fabulous children's ministry. That's just a, a sidebar for our church because we're doing, God is doing a great job to the people that are here for us and for this ministry. So we're blessed. But anyways, going back to, to Noah, the, the society was corrupt. And so God told Noah, I'm done. I'm done. I'm going to destroy the earth by flooding it. And God commanded Noah to build this ark. Now, obviously these things are not um, verbatim in the kid's story, but I love that in, in his word, in his word, he gives explicit instructions as to how to build this ark. Measurements, the cubic feet, the cubic feet, all of that. He gives explicit instructions, how high, what kind of wood to use. He even, he even goes to tell him what, what to use to bond yeah, bind this entire ark together. You know, there, there were no nails back then. You know that, right? So there was the slime that they made back then called pitch. He instructed him, put that together with pitch. He instructed for the ark to have one window. One window. Do you understand that? One window in this entire boat full of stank animals. Okay, one window. I don't know about you, but I need some circulation in that place. I mean, one window is a, is a little extreme for an ark. But the Bible, if you read your Bible, it says one window. And it was on the roof of the ark. One door on its side, one lower deck, second and third deck, 
and all the people that were going to be in it. He gave explicit instructions about all of that. God is a God of details. He's a God of details. So don't forget that when you're treading life, he knows everything about you. And he's a God of details. But not only were the, the explicit instructions to me crazy as to how, how ordered God is. The idea that God was going to flood the earth with water. I mean, can you imagine if Noah told all these people, listen, God is going to flood the earth. So I got to build this ark. I mean, that's not mainstream ideas. I'm sure he was against the grain. I'm sure people thought he was crazy because he's going to build this full-blown ark. And on top of it, I'm going to put a bunch of animals in it. I mean, that is not normal. That is a crazy idea. But Noah was crazy enough with his faith. And he believed God. And he was obedient. Genesis. Genesis. If you have your Bible, here's your scripture. I'm sure some of you are wondering. She has no scripture. I have a lot of scripture. Genesis 6.22 is very short. The Bible says, Thus Noah did according to all that God commanded him, so he did. Thus Noah did according to all that God commanded him, so he did. You know, Noah withstood humanity to do his own thing. Because I would have wanted to make five or six windows in that ark. No, he obeyed God. He didn't cut corners. He didn't tweak the ark like he wanted to. He didn't make extra things that God didn't, didn't instruct him to make. No, he did all, is what the scripture says. He did all according to what God commanded him to do. So he obeyed God. And I just don't know if I would have been able to obey God to the T. Because I, in my own human reasoning, would have thought, well, I have better ideas than you, God. I need more windows. I need some stalls for these. Well, maybe they had stalls, but I could have had some more brilliant ideas probably that that art could have had. But in Genesis 6, 8, it says, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So we're going to call this ark the ark of grace. You know why? You know why? Well, how, how, did, how did Noah find grace in the eyes of the Lord? How did Noah find grace in the eyes of the Lord? Let me tell you what uh, Genesis 6, 11 says. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God. Noah walked with God. And I did some research about what all this means because perfect to me is a little extreme. But I read some commentaries. They're not in the Bible. They're just some outside commentaries about his stature and his integrity. And that he was um, a man that was mature in the word. He knew God's word. And he knew God. Um, I don't know if he had faults. I had no idea. But the Bible speaks. If we take it for super, for, for face value, the man, the God, the word says that he was perfect. And we read in 622, Noah did according to all that God commanded him to do, and so he did. And so he did. So he did. So this was a man that had faith, and he believed God. And if this doesn't spell obedience to you, I don't know what does. As ludicrous as the plan was to make the ark, the man had obedience. The man had obedience. Noah was, not, was a man of obedience, and obedience is what offered him grace. I'm going to say that again. Noah was a man of obedience, and obedience is what afforded him grace. Obedience is what afforded him grace. Noah had a huge task to build this ark, and he found the grace to build it. He found the grace to build it. And how did he find grace to build it? Because he obeyed. He didn't cut the corners. He followed the plan. He followed the blueprint to the T, to the T, because this ark survived on the, the, the waters until God said it was time for the, for the waters to subside. 
We sometimes come to a fork in the road. We have a right and a left, and sometimes we have five options. Sometimes we come to a sudden shift in our lives, a halt, the stop of the sidewalk, a blockade, the, in, the, the massive amount of, of debris that's stopping us from, from pursuing the path that we're on. And Noah comes to a place in his life where God has given him this absurd blueprint. And he obeys. Do we obey when we come to a blockade, when we come to a halt, a sudden halt, when the, the sidewalk gets chopped off abruptly? Do we sit there and say, okay, God, I'm still going to obey you even though I don't know what you're doing. I'm still going to obey you even though I don't see the sidewalk because this blockade is, is keeping me from seeing what the sidewalk looks like. I know there's sidewalk on the other side, but I'm still going to obey you because I trust you, because I have faith in you. That's what Noah did. I know I'm on dry, dry ground right now. And I know it's crazy to put hundreds of animals on this ark. I know the, the people are talking negative about me, saying that I'm crazy. But I'm still going to obey you. I'm still going to obey you. 2 Peter 2.5 says that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. See, even the New Testament is still talking about this perfect man way back in Genesis. That Noah was a preacher of righteousness. This is 2 Peter 2.5. If you're going to preach it, you better be living it. If you're going to preach it, you better be living it. And I don't think that was Noah's agenda. I think Noah was preaching it and he was living it. He was preaching it and he was living it there. And therefore, that's how he heard from God and obeyed. Okay, God, I trust you. Obedience is going to follow and you're going to cover me. You're going to cover me. You're going to put these people to shame. Those that have spoke negative about me because they've, they've said that, I are, that I'm crazy. But his grace came and covered him because he obeyed God. <clears throat> he was a preacher and he lived it. You know, the, the, the saying, what would Jesus do? That's not just for preachers and pastors. What would Jesus do is for every person in this room. For every person in this room. When you, the Bible says we're all called to preach the gospel. We're all called to preach the gospel. Now we all preach it differently. We may preach it um, at our jobs with our employ, um, co-workers or employers or, or um, our friends at the grocery store. Um, it's not just up here on, on a pulpit. We're preaching the gospel in every way, form or fashion that we wake up every single day. How you handle life, how you dress, how you handle your money. People are watching you. This is you preaching the gospel to those around you that don't know Christ. How you love others in your care. How you treat your husbands behind doors, behind closed doors, or in front of people. How, how you are an employee, how you're an employer. When there is obedience found, there is grace to be found. When there is obedience found, there is grace to be found. Meaning, when you obey, the favor of God comes. The favor of God comes. I don't, I'm not sure if, if, if that would happen if I'm living slothfully. It's faith and works. Faith and works. If you want grace, then you have to obey. You want favor, you have to obey. I learned from my friend Dorcas with, with Joshua, obedience is the key, of bless, the key to blessing. And that, to me, is so important to start training up a child, to tell them, you obey, then you get the blessing. You disobey, then you don't get the blessing. That is applicable to us grown adults. If we obey, we get the blessing. If we obey, we get God's grace and favor over our lives. That is so true. It is so true. That is how Noah obtained grace is because he obeyed God. And when we believe his grace is sufficient, like the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 12, 9, 1 Corinthians 12, 9, it says, and this is Jesus talking. He's talking to Paul and he says, my grace is sufficient for you for my strength is made perfect in weakness. 
My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. You see, if you don't know the story about Paul, Paul had a thorn in his side. He had a thorn in his side and God permitted the thorn. God permitted the thorn. But Paul pleaded with God three times that he, he asked God, God, please make this thorn depart from me. And you know what God's answer was? No. He said, no, this thorn is going to remain in your side. He said, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. God is going to strengthen you. He's going to strengthen you on unlevel ground. God strengthens us when we are on unlevel ground. He strengthens us when the sidewalk finishes. He strengthens us because that is our weakness. That you don't have a smooth sail when you're on unlevel ground. But in our weakness, God comes and his grace comes and, and, and he allows us to tread with grace. And he has us and he strengthens us. But you have to obey. You have to obey. When we obey, we can rest that his grace is sufficient. And our faith in that he knows what he's doing. Maybe I don't know what God is doing. But I'm going to have faith that God knows what he's doing. I don't have to have all the details. I don't have to have the blueprints. But because I have faith in God, I'm going to obey. I'm going to obey God. You know, in my bike ride situation, I, I was purposed to ride on someone level ground and pitted ground. And on another situation, I had to ride around the blockade. In both bike situations, I had to obey my reasoning. It's logical, it's common sense to go around. But there was no room to murmur. What's the point of murmuring? There was no, what am I going to do? Who's going to come and rescue me? There's no time for murmur. We can't be cursing God because we don't understand why we have to drive or ride on this unlevel ground. Or why did the sidewalk get cut off suddenly? You know, and we, turn to, we tend to curse the people around us because sometimes we do have people in our lives that see what we're going through and we don't see what we're going through because we only see what's at stake, what's at hand. It's kind of like the message, who's a donkey in your life? Who's a donkey in your life? We tend to curse the people around us because they're telling us truth. We don't want to hear it, but sometimes they have insight as to, it's okay, it's a little unlevel, but God's grace is sufficient if you obey. If you obey, just keep on treading your bike. There's a sidewalk coming. There's a sidewalk coming. <clears throat> God is calling us to do something in our lives, and that is just to obey, just to obey him so he can blanket us. Think about that. So he can blanket us with grace. He can blanket you with grace. Looking at a baby right now, watching how sometimes we swaddle a baby. Or we even cover ourselves at night. Just imagine that. Envision that. That when we lay down at night, we roll a cover up. Envision that when you walk with God and you're obeying God, there goes the covers. He's covering you with grace. He's covering you with grace. See, Noah, Noah wasn't blanketed with grace without having obedience and faith. There had to have been obedience and faith for him to be covered in grace. For him to be covered in grace. There would not have been an ark built had Noah disobeyed God. Surely he would have found someone else. But God selected uh, Noah to build the ark. So thank goodness that, that Noah obeyed God and he built the ark and we got to start all over again with just Noah and his family. <clears throat> but there are areas in our lives that, that we want his grace, but we don't want to obey him. We want to partially obey him. And actually when you partially obey him, that's actually still disobedience. There has to be full obedience, full obedience. You know, we want, we want God to blanket our marriage, 
with grace, but we can't follow the basics of submission. We want God to blanket our finances, but we can't follow the basics of tithing. I promise I'm not going to preach to you about tithing and offering. But it's the fact of the matter. If you can't be entrusted with the little, how is God going to entrust you with more? You know, we want God to bless us with a new job, but we can't submit to our current employer. We want, we want to come and worship God and lift hands and give him praise, but we don't want to forgive our brother and our, and our sister. There's still unforgiveness in our heart, and God is calling you to forgive. We want God to bless our temples, our bodies, but we still eat all the junk food. We still eat all the junk food. I'm preaching to the choir, okay? I'm preaching to the choir. My cheat day is on the weekend now. It's on the weekends. But it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. David, David was obedient and God showed him favor in many wars. He, has many he had many victories and triumphs because David obeyed God. And he gave God honor and praise and put him first. And I mean, David was the, one, of, one of the greatest kings. Another story about David, which I love. I love the story about David. And if you don't know the story, I'm going to encourage you to go to Samuel. Um, Samuel 1, book of Samuel, 1 Samuel or 2 Samuel, I can't remember. But go to Samuel. Read the whole, the whole thing. It's good. You'll find it, I promise. But it is. It's in there. There was a time where God gave David specific instructions as to how to carry the Ark of the Covenant. I don't know if you know what the Ark of the Covenant is. It's where back in ancient days, God's presence lived in this reservoir. And at that time, there were Levitical priests assigned to hold the Ark of the Covenant. There, were a man, there was a man at each corner. And they were assigned to hold the Ark of the Covenant and carry it to where every des the destinations that they were walking to. And there were specific instructions as to how to handle it. And one day, a Levite, a Jewish priest, went to touch it. And the man was struck dead immediately. And David was grieved over that. David was grieved because he couldn't understand why God would strike this man dead. And God reminded him, there are specific instructions about my, my anointing, my glory, where I reside. You need to follow that. And then David got over that and realized, you're right. There are, there are specific instructions. Then he went back and followed his instruction plan as to how to hold the, the Ark of the Covenant. And then they were able to carry the Ark of the Covenant. Then that's when grace came. They're able to, to walk around with this, with this um, reservoir. And then there was a time also where David was seeking a place to house the Ark of the Covenant. And we have Mr. Obadidim. He was a Gittite. Obadidim. David asked him, listen, we need to house the Ark of the Covenant in your home. And the man of God, well, I don't, I'm sure he was a man of God, but he believed the man of God. David said, sure, house. House the, how, the, the Ark of the Covenant in my home. You can have at it. And the Bible says in 2 Samuel 6.11, the ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obadiah, the Gittite, for three months. And the Lord blessed him and his entire household. Are you going to obey God so he can bless you and your entire household? Are you going to obey God so he can bless you and your entire household? That man was a blessed man. He got to house the reservoir, God's reservoir and his entire household was blessed. I'm sure, I'm sure there are areas, at least one, at least one that you can think of that you can probably take it to God and say, God, I've got to obey you in this area. I've got to fix this. I've got to make this right because I need grace. I need grace in this area. And, and like I said, this is applicable to everybody, applicable to me. Because we can't come to God and 
and abuse grace. He's asking us to be obedient. When he speaks, we better listen. When he says something, we better listen. God will not be mocked. He will not be mocked, and he's not going to be fooled. You know, God is saying, I don't want your sacrifices. I don't want your sacrifices. I don't want your lip service. I just want your obedience. I just want your obedience. You can come into the house of the Lord. I know this is tight, but it, but it fits. We can come into the house of the Lord every Sunday. And if we're constantly disobeying God, all that is in vain. We can do a devotion every single morning. And if we are disobeying God, that is in vain. It is in vain because God says, obedience is better than sacrifice. Your obedience is better than sacrifice. So I'm going to ask you tonight, <clears throat> where do you want grace to abound? Where do you want grace to abound? Where in your life do you want grace to abound? Think about it. Think about it. I already, when, I, when, when the Lord gave me this message, I immediately knew what God was talking to me about. I didn't have to think about it. I didn't have to go through my journal and see what I was struggling with. I know where I need to obey. I know where there's been disobedience in my life. So I want you to think about where you want grace to abound. Because grace comes when obedience is there. And actually, obedience is calling forth grace. It's calling forth grace. Your obedience is calling forth grace. So where there's disobedience, there's disgrace. So I need you to think about that. And if Jasmine doesn't mind coming up and, and closing us out, if this really hit me about where do you want grace to abound? Where do you want grace to abound? Obedidim, his entire household had a blessing because he listened to the man of God. David said, I need a place to house the reservoir. Obedidim said, have it. You can have my home. Grace resided in his home. Where do you need grace to abound? Where do you need grace to abound? Do you need grace to abound in your relationships? Do you need grace to abound in a relationship with a, with a mother or a father? Do you need grace to abound in, in your, with your spouse? Do you, need, do you need grace with your marriage? Do you need grace in, in, in a work setting? It doesn't, grace doesn't sound applicable when, it come, when I say work setting, but I think about what Joyce Meyer said. See, Joyce Meyer is very applicable, practical, so we can apply. You can't be at your job and taking all the, all the supplies from the supply cabinet. And I'm coming, I'm coming from because sometimes we work all these hours and we end up taking all these things in our pockets, all these paper clips and all these pins. And if you're a nurse, all these gloves. Well, you're stealing from your employer. That wasn't written out to you. Little, little places like that. If we want grace to come, we're not obeying the, the Holy Spirit speaking to, the, speaking to us. Just leave all that here. You don't need all that. You don't need 5,000 pins at your house. You don't need 1,000 paper clips that belong to your employer. It's really not worth it. It's little things like that. It's little thorns like that that keeps us from grace. And then sometimes it's blatant disobedience to God. This is Pastor Daniel. I hope the message has touched you and I hope that, you know what, Holy Spirit's there tugging on your heartstrings and I'm hoping that you are willing to make a decision to follow Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. I know for me, it was a young child that I gave my heart to the Lord, but then, then I didn't live uh, my relationship for the Lord. I lived my relationship through my parents for the Lord. And then there was a time in my life where 
things just went wrong and went bad and, and the Holy Spirit was tugging at my heart and saying, hey, look, you know what? It's time. And I got on my knees. I cried out to the Lord and I made Jesus my Lord and Savior. And that was my relationship with him. And I know he's calling you right now into a relationship. And I just want to give you an opportunity to just enter in and give Jesus Christ your life and receive him as your Lord and Savior. It's this simple. All you have to do is close your eyes and bow your head and say, Dear Jesus, I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I ask you to come into my heart and change my life. And I surrender my will to you in Jesus' name. If you've said that prayer, I'm telling you, you are saved. You are on the way to heaven. And he just wants you to live according to his word. So get into a church, start serving, get into the word of God and make a difference in your life. Hopefully you received a word from the Lord today. If you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, be sure to email us at admin at peak worship so that we can stay in contact with you. We want to make sure that you get plugged into a church in your area and we'll see you next time.